hey there everybody, how y'all doing out there? I'm uh, live here on YouTube today, this is going to be a, a guitar workshop. I have a, a variety of subjects that I, I'm planning on covering, but I really want this to be a, an interactive uh, workshop. So if anyone has any questions or ideas, I'm watching the chat here. G'day Paul in Seattle. And uh, Juanjo from Barcelona. I hope I said your name correctly, mate. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about technique and then go into some, some thoughts on uh, things like improvising, playing fingerstyle guitar, playing electric guitar. We can talk about gear, basically anything you're, you're, you're interested in. But um, I thought I'd just preface the workshop by saying, you know, before watching a workshop like this, what I would think is, do I want to listen to this person? Because, you know, I, I always ask this question, you know, it's that saying, never trust a philosopher who isn't an athlete. <laughs> And, you know, there are so many people on YouTube these days with, with an opinion. And I think it's important to ask yourself, do I like this person's music? Do I think this person has expertise in the area there that, you know, they're, they're talk, talking about here? And, uh, you know, I, I think if, if you enjoy my music and you like my arrangements and you like the way I play, I'm an absolutely an open book and I want to tell you exactly how I did it. Um... I actually think it's it's quite a simple set of ideas, and uh, it is um, difficult, and it takes some some time and commitment and discipline. But um, in my experience, it's been so so worth every minute I've spent um, studying this instrument. Get a Louis in Tennessee. Get a Michael from Southern California. Please uh, let let me know where you're chiming in from. Brigitte from France. Hello. <laughs> So, um, to me, it's all about trying to practice well. So, trying to practice deliberately, trying to practice intentionally, and doing that consistently. Now, if you're a beginner on the guitar, I think, uh, you know, even as little as 30 minutes a day, if you do that every day by, you know, six months, you will no longer be a beginner. <laughs> that, that, that is to say, if you are practicing deliberately and intentionally. And, um, you know, we all need inspiration and we need direction. And so having um, a teacher or a mentor can be really, really invaluable. I had a teacher when I first started uh, for about the first year of playing and I learned folk songs and, you know, basic open chords and, and some, um, you know, I learned some of the Eric Clapton uh, unplugged songbook, and uh, my teacher Jeff Wallage is his name. He really helped me fall in love with the instrument. So I think having a teacher or a coach or a mentor can be really invaluable. However, we live in an amazing time where there is so much information out there online. So if if you want to learn to play like George Benson, there's a fellow out there who's who's selling courses, and he was George Benson's student, and he got George to sign off on these official George Benson guitar courses. I, I haven't taken them, but I'm sure they're, they're really good. Um, if you want to learn to play like Tommy Emmanuel, there's a million tabs and there's a million videos and there's tutorials and, and true fire videos. And the same with me, you know, I have a lot of content out there. Um, so I think having a mentor and having a place you go for good information is, is really important. Um, but just in a, in a general sense, I, I just want to, explain how I think about practicing. So I like to practice in 15 minute increments of time and I have a timer. This timer is actually set to 30 minutes and um, I will uh, I have a, a practice journal and if I have two hours to practice for example I will write 15 minutes, 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 15 minutes and I will kind of just build myself a little practice schedule based on what I'm trying to accomplish that day. It usually starts with warming up with some stretches and technical exercises, which I'm going to show you the left hand exercises I do and the right hand exercises. Um, very much influenced by the great John Petrucci, who I, I was really um, 
honored to have a phone a phone conversation with the the other day. I chatted with both uh, Steve Morse and John Petrucci on the phone. It was like really really special. But uh, I do some technical exercises, and then usually I'm working on you know new songs I'm composing or arranging. That's a big part of of what I do, and um, and uh, you know I think it's good to start a practice session. You know after you've warmed up and and stretched. And I always stretch before I practice and, and I play. Um, starting off with kind of whatever requires the, the most um, mental energy, the most concentration. So whatever is the most technical, if it's a part of a song that, that you're trying to work through, you know, playing that over and over again. It's not unusual for me to take one bar of a song that I'm working on and play it over and over again for 15 minutes. You know, anyone who's been in the house with me when I'm practicing can can testify to that. I'll just repeat the same thing over and over and over and over again. And the the kind of most important thing to always keep in mind when when practicing, especially a difficult or new technique, is to stay relaxed and have no tension. So you're always trying to get the left hand to be strong and controlled but with no tension. So you don't want any tension in the forearm. And with the right hand, you don't want any tension in the, in the forearm or the shoulders, hopefully. You know, it's, it's impossible to play with completely perfect posture. But uh, we all do our best. And I find that practicing in front of a mirror can be really, really useful. Um, not only to monitor your posture, but also to... Um, get out of the habit of just staring at your hands all the time. That being said, I'll still look at my hands all the time. You know, I'll, I'll post a video of myself playing and someone will say, Joe, you keep looking at your hands. You're supposed to look out at the audience. Well, let me tell you, when I'm on stage, I can look at, at the crowd and I can look each person in the eye. And that's a, that's a really liberating thing to be able to do. I'm not just locked into staring at my fingers. So practicing in front of a mirror can, can, can be really helpful. Um, so... With that kind of a, a, a routine, you know, for me, I have to turn all distraction off. I really love to do it without a computer. Sometimes I, I involve a computer in my practicing, you know, wh whether I'm using Guitar Pro to kind of arrange a song and, you know, find um, ways of playing an arrangement that I, that I would have a, a difficult time figuring out on the instrument it's easier for me to kind of map it out in in the notation software um, but for the most part my best practicing is done w without technology I use my phone to record myself and you know I got a metronome on my phone which which is really handy but for 90 percent of the day my phone stays in airplane mode I don't even turn it on <laughs> um, for most of the day, I'll, I'll see if anyone called and if I have voice messages or calls to make, I'll switch it on. And I use the Wi-Fi on it sometimes. But, you know, just generally speaking, I think in order to to make progress on, on our instrument, we have to be able to to to, to focus. And there's a great book by, by Cal Newport called Deep Work, which is really just about, you know, the idea that if you want to do something that has value in, in, in the world, you have to be able to, to, to focus and switch switch off the distraction, the things competing for, for your attention, uh, namely social media, um, scrolling through feeds, and you know, all notifications are, are off for me. So um, that being said, I want to get into some specific things to, to practice and, and work on. Um, get a Rick from Portugal, Peter from Vienna, New Jersey, T TJ, New Jersey. Thailand, wonderful. Lucas says, "I say Joe has a water touch. It's so fluid and smooth." Well, that's a that, that that's a really interesting point. You know, I played this workshop at this uh, classical school, and Stanley Yates was the the professor. And Stanley kind of, you know, wrote a few books on classical guitar technique. And he said, "Joe, for a fingerstyle player, you have a very legato style, meaning the the left hand is very." is very smooth and the notes kind of connect together well and um, this next exercise is is what I credit with giving me a nice fluid and smooth water touch as you say Lucas so 
I got this from a John Petrucci DVD, Rock Discipline. And basically what I will do, and but before I do it, I will always stretch before I, I practice. And I've stretched this morning, but I'm going to demonstrate what I do just to show you. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not a physical therapist, so don't injure yourself or hurt yourself and, and come suing me. But I will stretch the, the wrist like this for about 10 seconds. Then I'll stretch it forward for about 10 seconds. And I'm doing it faster here just for demonstration purposes. And I'll take the thumb and pull it back. And you want to kind of just warm up the muscles. You don't want to hurt yourself. This shouldn't be painful. Brazil, Jamaica, London. You just do the same thing with the other hand. And uh, it's in important to do, especially before this exercise, because this exercise is going to require a lot of strength. I guarantee even advanced players who've been playing for 20 years like me will um, you know, feel this in, in the hands. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the first finger and play the fifth fret on the B string. And we're going to hammer onto the sixth fret with the second finger. And keep going. And we would do this for about 30 seconds to begin with. If you're just starting out, 45 seconds is a good amount to aim for. And if you can get it up to a minute, that's great. And you want to try and stay relaxed in the forearm, but you want to just isolate the muscles needed to sound those notes clearly. And it doesn't need to be in time. In fact, you can speed it up and slow it down. You can experiment with the kind of downbeat accent or the upbeat. But the important idea is just to get a, a nice clean motion going. Okay, so once you've done that for, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds a minute, do it with the next two fingers. And this will be a bit more difficult, you'll find. And you can just leave the first finger hanging there, it doesn't really matter. I wouldn't try to do it like that, that's kind of awkward. <laughs> And I usually try to keep my forearm pretty much straight. So if I was to play with like the classical thumb on the back of the neck thing like that, like that to me feels really uncomfortable. Maybe because I'm playing a slimmer neck and I have, you know, reasonably big hands. But just generally speaking, I'm trying to keep my wrist pretty much straight. Okay, now here comes the tricky one is the pinky. Now, doing this, I'm pretty sure most people are going to struggle. But it's really worth training that pinky to have some dexterity and strength. And you'll definitely feel this, especially if you haven't done it before. And after doing that for a while, that's, that's really the, the basics of it. There, there's a few other little movements you can do, like this one. It's a really good one. It's just going six, eight, six, five. And then you go seven, eight, seven, five. So with the ring finger involved. Switch back and forth if you want. And so the idea is not to do them in time or anything, just to do them for, you know, a, a length of time. Whether you start out at 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute, you know, two minutes. Um, you, you'll, you'll be able to do it more on an electric guitar with lighter strings, but on an acoustic, you know, if you can get to 45 seconds, that's, that's a good amount, especially with the pinky. So after doing that exercise, I would encourage you all to stretch the left hand again a little bit, because... You'll feel it, for sure. And what we're trying to do is just get the left hand 
to cooperate and do whatever we require of it. And having that strength is really, really important. And, you know, if, if you're at a point where you're, you're working on like bar chords, for example, and, you know, just for the record, I hate playing bar chords. You, you'll very rarely see me playing, you know, like full bar chords in my songs. I'd usually play it like that. I use my thumb. I just think it feels, you know, it just doesn't feel great to play a bar chord, so I'll usually use the thumb. But if you're at a point where you're learning a new chord, learning new chord shapes, a great thing to do is just to get the left hand to hammer down the chord like a D9 there, or a G6, and practice just doing that hammering motion. D6 now. Don Peach showed me that. So no matter whether you're learning like a G chord, or a D chord, or an F bar chord, or like a jazz blues progression, <laughs> that, that hammering motion can be, can be great for the left hand. So we've just been talking about the left hand so far, but if you were to spend, you know, the first part of your practice session working on those little uh, legato hammer-on pull-off exercises, you know, th that's one of the best ways you, you, can, uh, you can isolate the movement necessary on the left hand to, to have good technique and to be able to articulate whatever ideas you want clearly. Because that's the goal of technique for me is, you know, if my technique is not there and I'm rusty or I haven't played in a while, then I really struggle to get my ideas across because I don't just I don't have that freedom of being able to play whatever I want. So for me, technique really is to serve the music. And um, at the end of the day, there's a lot of great musicians with incredible technique, and um, you know, it it can't stop there. You have to focus on playing great music and great songs. And, you know, we're going to talk about I improvising and music theory and harmony and, and, and all that. Um, but my thoughts on all that is basically, at the end of the day, just play me a, a song. <laughs> I want to hear a good song. You know, uh, to, to me, it's the poker machine test in Australia. You know, growing up, we'd play in these pubs where there's poker machines. And if you didn't play anything, well, if you just sat up there and played some noodley noodly um, chords and didn't really engage with people, you would not get people to leave the poker machines. <laughs> but if Tommy Emmanuel get, got up on that stage, or if Eric Johnson in the RV Music On Band got up on that stage, every single person would be glued to what's going on, uh, through, through what's coming through those speakers. And um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's always got to be about playing the song, playing a, a great piece of music. So anyway, that's a good little set of left hand exercises. Now with the right hand, um, I'll start off with, with fingerstyle guitar, talking about that since I'm on the acoustic. Um, we had a, request, a question about I improvising. I, I'm definitely going to get to that. Um, yeah, I had another question from Thomas, who, who went through Joe's 12, my course. Um, would love to know what opened your mind about improvising and fretboard. I'll, I'll definitely go into that. But since I've talked about the left hand technique, I want to go into the right hand technique. So with fingerstyle guitar, I think the best way to get the right hand to have good control and independence and coordination is to learn a lot of songs. So fingerstyle songs, you know, in the, in the fingerstyle repertoire, we have so many great songs to learn. It can be freight train. <laughs> Train windy and warm. And the thing with 
learning uh, new songs with fingerstyle technique is, you know, there's just a limitless number of ways you can play these six strings. And with playing fingerstyle guitar in, in, in this style, kind of tra Travis style guitar playing, we have the thumb providing this accompaniment groove. And then you have the fingers jumping in. Change chords. And the thumbs got to change the bass pattern. So rather than just doing exercises like that, which there are some good exercises, and you know, I teach exercises in a few of my, my courses I have, but for the most part, the best way to cross-train your fingers to play all kinds of different combinations of notes is to learn a bunch of songs. So the second song's easier to learn than the first, the third song's easier than the second, and by, by the time you get up to playing 15 or 20 fingerstyle arrangements, you know, from Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed, Tommy Emmanuel, um, you know, a couple of my songs might be, might be easy, like strutting, strutting it. Songs with a walking bass are, are really great as an alternative to the kind of static chord thumb accompaniment style. So that's basically the way to get the, the finger style right hand chops together, in my opinion. Now, I don't use fingernails on my right hand. I just play with the pads of the fingers. I like the tone of that on a steel string guitar. Whenever I play nylon string guitar, I, I find myself saying, man, I wish I had fingernails because you can get such a beautiful sound on nylon string. But on a steel string, I like the sound of, of the flesh on the, on the strings. And I use a thumb pick. The thumb pick I use is a Dunlop medium. And, uh, um, yeah, there's lots of di different types of thumb picks. I I'd say just get one that fits nice and tight. Not too tight. You don't want your thumb turning, turning purple. Like some thumb picks make my thumb do that. But, uh, yeah, Dunlop medium, you know, you can find them just about everywhere in the world. And, and um if you have larger thumbs, Dunlop large might be good, and smaller thumbs, they're small, but the small is pretty dang, dang small. So, um, yeah, I use a, th a thumb pick, and the thing I think is important to practice and keep in mind and just always be thinking about is, you know, aside from the groove and the timing and the feeling of the music, is the dynamics. And I, I've, you know, kind of ranted and raved about this before, but if I take a song like, like Borsalino, which was re recorded by Tommy Emanuel and Chet Atkins, if I was to play it uh, kind of with no dynamics, which is very difficult to do, it would sound like this. You know, if every note's even, it, it just kind of sounds like bland, like a like a, a computer playing the MIDI back or something. But if you put some dynamics into it, it starts to sound like music. And and you know I think the dynamics between the the notes of the strings and between the thumb. Is just so important and that really takes a while to, to develop but it's an important thing to be able to do as well as to be able to kind of make some rolling motions like this which is just letting the right hand kind of brush over those strings thumb first second middle and index, middle and ring. So that you can take a melody like Freight Train and instead of playing it just totally static, you can play it with, with some flair and some of those rolls. So that's about, you know, all I, I think is, is worth saying on the right hand with regard to fingerstyle playing 
you know, generally you want your wrist to be at a 45 degree angle. You know, some people play more like this type of style and some people anchor their pinky. You know, my pinky just... When I anchor my pinky, I can't use it for a start, and I can't also use my ring finger very well. So I don't anchor the pinky, and um, I, I do use the pinky quite often. I find, um, yeah, it just doesn't work for me. Maybe if you have a double jointed pinky. I know a lot of finger style guitarists uh, do anchor the pinky. So with a uh, straight pick, we're going to move on to talking about flat picking now. And I'm going to change to an electric guitar here, because I have one. Hope you all are having a good day out there. Turn on the electric here. I had a question. Joe, do you work with practice schedules? How do you manage it in a way that it all comes together? Well, I do work with a practice schedule, and I'm not sure if you heard the earlier part of the, the workshop here, but um, I keep a practice journal and actually brought out last year's practice journal. This was from May to January of this year. And as you can see, it's just you know, a bunch of 30 minute blocks and 15 minute blocks. And uh, you know, not all of this is practicing. Some of it's just, you know, I make a list of all the stuff I've got to do in a day, whether it's editing videos or whether it's, you know, sending emails, doing my taxes. Um, you know, all the, all the kind of things that that are unnecessary to, to keep me keep me floating along here in this music game. But uh, how, how do I manage it? Well, I like to practice first thing in the morning. These days, I'm waking up very early. I've been waking up at 4 a.m., although the last few days I've been waking up at, I've been sleeping until 5 or 5.30. But, uh, you know, for me, the morning is my favorite time to practice before any distractions come in, you know, I just love the feeling of the sun coming up and me, me playing and, and being focused. Um, and as I said earlier, I worked with 15 minute blocks and, uh, you know, I have a variety of technical things I like to practice, but for the most part, it's working on songs and, and arrangements. So for the right hand, this is a, just a real simple exercise that comes from the school of you know, John Petrucci and Steve Morse and the alternate picking rock and roll guys. Kind of learning how to do that. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that now. That's, that's considered alternate picking, and I'm just using a ja Dunlop Jazz 3. Um, and I'm just going to address a couple questions here. Any tips for flat pick, alternate picking, and building fluency with with phrasing? Um, I'll, I'll give you a rapid answer for that. Uh, flat pick, alternate picking. Um, well, we, we're going to go into that, that right now. Um, but building fluency with phrasing. To me, phrasing is all about rhythm. So it's all about rhythm and dynamics. So if you can really study rhythm, and a great way to study rhythm is with a, a drum practice pad like this. I'll show you. This is hanging around in my practice studio. I have a drum pad, and I'll sit there with sticks and play rudiments. And I'll do it with a metronome, and I have a, um, you know, a variety of books with sticking techniques. And if you can really study the, the, the rudiments, and uh, sticking co combinations with the right and left hand, I think that really helps with your, your rhythmic pocket on the guitar, which helps with 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 phrasing. So, um, any good advice for mastering sweep picking? Well, this these exercises help with alternate picking, and you know can also help with sweep picking. So, basically, if you take four notes per string. Walking up, and then once you get to the top, go up one more fret, and then go down. And then you accent the downbeat every four. So it's a sixteenth note phrase, and you accent it the downbeat. So what 
you do is you get a metronome and uh, and some of you will be rolling your eyes thinking okay he's really gonna go through like this the shredder speed training um, you know handbook here but if you start the metronome at 80 and do that you notice it's pretty easy speed it up to 84 well, speed up to 88. Speed it up more to 96. Keep going. 104 now. I'm doing this I'm uh, just trying to be relaxed with the right hand and play with a light touch and I am palm muting the strings and some people will say you know don't palm mute the strings you want all the notes to, to be really crystal clear well if you if you're kind of playing gypsy jazz music on an acoustic that's really important but if you're playing electric guitar and you got some gain it's good to palm mute the strings and uh, and you know whether or not you want to play like that all the time it's it's a good exercise trust me I find that the most difficult tempo is like 100 to 120 and then to play it slowly, slower than that is pretty easy and then to speed it up, you know, it's pretty easy until you get to like 150 or so. So I'll keep going, we'll go to 112. And this metronome I have is a Chord TM60 I think and it's, it's great, however once you get faster it starts to, you know, you press this tempo up button, it doesn't go up evenly in increments, it starts to go um, in higher increments as you get, you know faster anyway here we go 112 okay we'll keep going 120 keep going holding the pick pretty loose yeah very much so it's definitely not super tight um, I don't quite know how to explain it yeah it's, it's honestly it's really loose and my whole body is trying to be trying to be loose and uh, I, I like these picks it's, it's just a Dunlop Jazz 3 it's nothing fancy on an acoustic I use one of those blue chip picks and they cost like 30 bucks or 40 bucks but I haven't lost one yet I have two of them and they sound great on acoustic but um, but yeah, this is just a regular old Jazz 3. Okay, 144 now. Let's see how fast I can go today. We'll go up to 160. See if I can get there. Keep going, see see where I get to stop. 168. Keep going, 176. See, I feel my arms starting to tense up now. And I also feel like the the accents aren't as articulate. So generally, I'm not trying to get as fast as I can. I'm just trying to get clean and even and kind of make it so that I can play, you know, at, at, at a variety of tempos, nice and clean and without tension. Because uh, am I picking in small circles? Now, that's, that's just straight up and down. It's just, it's just straight up and down, mostly from the wrist or from the wrist. So, and you know, I'm not a, like a, a right hand freak, like that's not a huge part of what I do. Um, I shouldn't say I'm not a right hand freak, that <laughs> doesn't really make sense. Like, I'm not a, um, if I play a show, I'm using a flat pick, you know, maybe 
15% of the time. Most I'm mostly playing finger style, but I think being able to do that from a technique standpoint is is important. And it's pretty simple. Honestly, if you do that for um for uh, 15 minutes a day for 4 months, you'll you, you'll have it down. And the good thing about building kind of building a technique with like a speed trainer approach is you'll find out pretty quick that if you try to go too fast before you you're ready your your hands gonna tense up and lock up and so you've got to train yourself to have a really relaxed right hand so um, that's how you you do that and I'd recommend just starting f four notes per string 16th notes like that with, with an accent and um, Aside from that, we can talk about a vibrato. I'm just going to kind of go into some, some random concepts now, I think. What kind of blue chip pick do you use on acoustic garage top? I use a... The blue chip pick I use is called the TAD60. And my friend Trey Hensley, who's an incredible flat picker, you know, I, I knew that he was using it. So I, um, I, I picked one up. I, I, I also use wagon picks quite a bit. In fact, I have this wagon pick sitting right here. Yosho, St Yosho Stefan gave me this pick. I've had it for years. I, I, he actually gave me a bag full of them. Um, but the, the, these are really great for playing gypsy swing music. I think the blue chips sound sound better. Um, but the blue chips and the wagons are ver very much, you know, an acoustic pick, also an arch top guitars. They're really great. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about vibrato. I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground now. I know I've been ranting and raving for about 40 minutes now. So vibrato is, I, I think, a really important technique. I stumbled upon this Steve Vai article when I was a teenager and it really, um, you know, it taught me all I needed to know about vibrato. And basically what he said is there's three different types of vibrato. There's up and down vibrato. There's side-to-side -side vibrato, which you can hear better on wound strings. And there's like a circular kind of vibrato, which is a lot easier to do on a lighter set of strings. I'm using 11s, they're kind of heavy. But he suggested, you know, getting into kind of almost like a meditative trance with one note, trying to find all the different ways to squeeze all the tone out of that note. And I've done that at different points in my life. I won't say I do it regularly, but sitting there for an hour playing one note and just trying to get all the tone you can out of it. With different fingers. I mostly do up and down vibrato. And also bending. Trying to get that to be really comfortable and smooth. Whether you're doing whole step bends or half step bends. So, anyway, I think vibrato is an important th thing to practice. There's definitely no shortage of, of good things to practice. Um, talking about improvising, uh, what opened my mind about improvising and the fretboard, etc.? Well, honestly, it was when I was. 11 years old and I took a gig playing with a, a country singer named Texas Rose and Texas had a repertoire of a thousand songs allegedly and every gig she would just play songs that I'd never heard before so I had to figure out how to basically like play solos with you know like country rock songs that I'd never heard before and the thing about playing like a country rock song is if you play a wrong note you really hear it you, you, you can't really fake your way through that so I um you know I, I will say on the subject of ear training and having perfect pitch you know I'm seeing a lot of videos these days about perfect pitch and people you know saying that you know building doing ear training exercises and all that's re really important and for me you know I don't think that's really a big part of playing music I think if you want to do ear training exercises, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, um, 
you know, I don't have a particularly great ear. I think the most important thing to, well, the most important part about being a, a musician is listening, and it's listening to the sound you're making from your instrument. It's listening to the timing and the, the feeling and the, you know, the song itself. It's listening to the room you're playing in. It's listening to the audience. You know, it's not necessarily analyzing, oh, that's a minor third interval, that's a major third interval. I mean, to me, you can... You, you can keep all that stuff. I, I don't. I don't really, um, you know, want it interfering with with my um, my kind of spiritual relationship with music. I know a few people with perfect pitch who say that it's ruined music for them because, you know, they just listen to a song, you know, a, a composition, and, and they hear all the notes and all the nuances and every single thing that that's going on, and they just comp computing the 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 math of it. And um, and they don't feel inspired to compose or create new music because they just know how it all sounds already. And f for me, like it's all about trying to play a song and trying to create something something musical. So um, where was I going with that? Improvising. So w when I was on the bandstand trying to play <laughs> solos with with this band Texas Rose, I realized that. You know, you can only play the A minor pentatonic scale so much. So that's the first step in improvising for most people is learning the A minor pentatonic scale. We all know that. And uh, the next step, once you know that, is to move it up to a couple of different positions, such as expanding it to here. up to here and if you're thinking to yourself I don't know how to do that well that's one of the best things you, you can do for learning the, the, the fretboard and that would be a great 15 minute block is just learning the A minor pentatonic scale all over the guitar Mistake or something. That that to me is not optional. If you want to improvise, you got to know the fretboard. Well, I mean, you can improvise. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. For me, it's not optional. Like I like to know the, the the fretboard in a basic way, and I feel like I couldn't improvise comfortably if I didn't. But you can certainly improvise, you know, just using two notes if, if you want. And in fact, a lot of great music is created with just, you know, really simple scales and primitive musics. And some people said, some guy, someone said to me, you know, those guys in Earth, Wind and Fire, Joe, they didn't know what notes they were playing or what chords they were playing, but it grooved and it was, it was funky. So all that, all that with a grain of salt. I, I'm a little OCD and I like to know the, 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 the fretboard and I highly recommend you explore the, the, the fingerboard and um, once you have the, the pentatonic scale down like that in terms of learning it in different shapes, different blocks along the neck, and you know, I have a tr I'm, I'm not trying to sell you anything in, in this workshop, but I do have a True Fire course called 10 Scales and Modes You Must Know, and I teach exactly that, how to play the, the different scales. Um, but if, you, if you're at a place where you know those shapes already, which you know, a, lo a lot of people will, then l learning to play more horizontally. So for example, playing the pentatonic scale on one string. Etc. And uh, and then improvising. Maybe just pick the G string and the E string to improvise in. Picking a, a couple strings and playing them vertically up the neck, that's a great way to practice improvising. Beyond the pentatonic scale, the major scale is the next scale to be comfortable with. And, you know, if you play a C, C major 7 chord, 
And, uh, you know, if I was just to create, create a little loop there. We're getting real jazzy today. The looper I use, by the way, is the Boss RC1. I was in the original advertisement for it. And uh, it's a simple pedal, it's $99, it's great. So, playing the C major scale all over the neck. That's one position. Another position. another position and some people will say you know I can play the scales Joe but I, I don't know how to turn the phrases into into music well um, I think you have to you have to kind of turn tune in to your inner melodic voice because and and it takes some it takes practicing you know and there's there's great tools for doing this like I use that app iReal Pro which is you know, it's. I think it's become pretty popular now, and there's tons of, of songs in there. But you can type in your own chords and have it play a backing track for you. And and there's also plenty of backing tracks on YouTube if you search up C major seven backing track or C C major scale backing track. You'll find tons of videos to improvise with, and it's great to just find find as many different ways to skin the cat as you can. So finding ways of you know, playing the scale using thirds, like um, maybe playing the scale on two strings, playing uh, like I said horizontally up, up the neck I think knowing just the major scale all over the fingerboard is really useful I mean you can do a lot with just the C major scale like this From there, you know, learning the modes I think is is really useful. And some of you might have might have thought, okay, he's playing the C major scale starting on the E, so he's playing, you know, uh, what's that E, Locrian or Phrygian. <laughs> um, you know, to me, learning how to play like the Dorian mode is really really handy, really useful. Learning the Mixolydian mode is really really useful. Learning the harmonic minor scale and the melodic minor scale. Really, really useful. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm getting into a little bit too much theory and, and all these things. But um, uh, knowing, you know, a few of the basic scales, more importantly, le learning what they sound like and, and knowing how to apply them over a chord. And a simple way to think about it for me is like if you're playing Santana's Evil Ways, which is A minor to D. song you got to change your evil ways so uh, that song features a minor and so you can play a minor pentatonic over that but then it goes to this D major chord and the D major has an F sharp note in it which says okay we can play an a minor scale with an F sharp in it what scale would that be well at hints at the Dorian mode a a a Dorian and and some people will say Oh, Joe, isn't the Dorian mode the second degree of, 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 you know, a major scale? So wouldn't it be G major? Well, the notes are the same as G major if you're playing A Dorian, but it's not very helpful to think of, okay, I have an A minor and a D chord, I'm going to play G major scale. That, to me, just doesn't really register very well. So thinking of it as the A Dorian mode, 
Here's the Dorian scale. You know, it's just one shape, you, you can play it. And that's a good scale to use in a song like Evil Ways. And I'm sure there's an Evil Ways backing track out there you can jam away to a, a Dorian on a, a your heart's content or whatever key the, the backing track's in. But uh, I used to jam on that song a lot. And if you listen to the Allman Brothers and a lot of these jam bands, you know, that they'll just kind of go into a Dorian mode jam for, you know, 20 minutes here, here and there. Alternatively, if the song's going down to F from A minor, like, My baby wrote me an airplane Take a ride on a fast train You know, that the song, The Letter. Um, if we're going to an F chord, then the F note, you want to kind of play the F note on top of the A minor scale, so you can play the A minor pentatonic over the A minor. But, but what, what else could, could you add? Well, you could add the F note, and that kind of leans toward the Aeolian mode, or the natural minor scale. Now, the note, notes in the A minor scale, natural minor scale, are the same as the C major scale, because it's the relative minor. So... Um, because we've already learnt the C major scale all over the neck, we already know the A natural minor scale. So, but you wouldn't think of it as a C major scale. You think of it as as A because you want to resolve to kind of the target notes, you know, within the scale, um, being like A, C, and E. You want your phrases to kind of resolve in an intentional way. So, if it's going to A minor to F. You can play the natural minor scale if it's going to A minor to D, Dorian mode. So that, that's just a, a little way to think of it. And uh, in terms of, you know, what it's really all about, which to me is playing the blues, you know, how can you play the blues? Well, you know, the blues has elements of, you know, if I was to take a... So the element, the blues has elements of the major pentatonic. Kind of the BB King sound. Elements of the Mixolydian scale. And uh, it also has elements of the bebop dominant scale, which sounds like this. change with the chords a little bit we'll talk about that more in, in a moment but you can play the blues with a lot of different ingredients and uh, I highly recommend you listen to the great blues players and the great jazz blues players you know listen to T-Bone Walker and Albert King and uh, you know there's there's so many great records and focus on the phrasing the vibrato the bending BB King, of course, had the classic bend, the vibrato and bend. And, uh, and check out the bebop dominant scale. You know, for me, that was a really handy scale in learning how to play over a dominant seventh chord, which a blues is made of dominant seventh chords. And, uh, and when changing be between chords, it, if we were to take a song like... Um, like, I kind of want to talk about the blues a little more, but if we were to take a song like um, Black Magic Woman and you were to play uh, just the D natural minor scale over this song. So the D natural minor scale is this. So 
that's, that's all we're going to play. And if the chords were... How does that go? So if I was to play over those chords, those three chords, D minor, A minor, and G minor, all the notes I need are in the D natural minor scale. However, when I change to the A minor, I kind of want to land on the notes that are in that chord if I want it to have a, you know, a feeling of resolving a phrase. And over the G minor, I'd want it to resolve to the notes in that chord. So in the D minor scale, the kind of notes you would resolve to would be the D, the F, and the A. So over the A minor chord, you would resolve to the A, the E, and the C. And over the G minor chord, you would resolve to the G, the D, and the B flat. So not that we want to get too caught up in the theory or the harmony or thinking at all. You know, we want to be playing music and making melodies. So I just want to, want to demonstrate how that sounds because a lot of people will say, how do you play over the changes? Well, this is kind of one step in, in having your melodic improvised lines follow the changes a, a little bit. So um, starting off on the D minor chord. Go into A minor. To D minor. G minor, D minor, A minor. So I'll just play a little bit on that. there on point. I'll keep going. So, you know, I've been playing for 20 years and uh, I've gotten a few phrases that I just love to play and it takes a while for those to come out and I suggest you know l listening to your favorite players listening to Robin Ford and Larry Carlton and John Schofield and uh, you know there's just so many great guitar players I've gotten really into listening listening to piano players lately listening to Errol Garner that's my kick is such a great record as well as um, Thelonious Monk and uh, you know and a, a lot of music um, composed for piano like, or harpsichord like Bach, you know, this great music. But, uh, you know, just finding cool licks to play is an important part of developing your vocabulary as a guitarist. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of one step at a time. It's learning the A minor pentatonic scale, it's learning the scale all over the fingerboard, it's learning the major scale and expanding that all over the fingerboard and getting used to just making music with that and then taking it a few chords like in Black Magic Woman for example and playing over just like the D natural minor scale and learning how to what getting comfortable with moving between the the D minor and the A minor and the G minor kind of highlighting the notes of those chords within your solos and then you know, we, we can go into to playing the blues using, you know, the major pen, pen, pentatonic and kind of the B.B. King style box here. And also, you know, borrowing from, from jazz with the bebop dominant scale. You know, there's a million different things we, we can do. And of course, 
um, playing over songs with with more intricate chord chord changes. You know, you can you can go all the way to giant steps with that stuff. And and um, anyway, I, I think that's a good place to to bail on the um, on the uh, Peter P- Peter Green. Be happy the way you play that Black Magic Woman. Thanks, thanks, John. To bail on the, on the theory side of things. So um, you know, I, I, a few things I, I wanted to just rant a, a little bit about. Is um, the f- the first one is is mentors having good mentors that you can learn from people who who whose music you really like because um, you know you you can't just go to someone on YouTube who's really good at marketing which there's a lot of people on YouTube that are very good at marketing and um, and not necessarily the best players if you want to really achieve great things study the best people. I'm not saying study me. I'm saying study the the best people you can find that that you think are the top of the game in whatever you know you're trying to trying to play. If I want to to play gypsy jazz, I'm going to listen to Django. <laughs> and if you want to play, you know, solo jazz guitar, listen listen to Joe Pass. And you don't necessarily always need to go to the past. I mean, there's definitely some incredible modern musicians up there. Um, there's this young Italian guy, man. Uh, I can't, I can't think of his name, man, man Cuso. Or he's absolutely unbelievable. He really blew, blew me away when I when I heard him recently. But um, but study the best people you can. Find good mentors, and no matter what town you're in, find the best musician in the area and ask them for advice. Ask them for a lesson, for a Skype lesson, for a Zoom lesson. You know, pick their brains. Be annoying. And uh, and go go out there. Every good thing that's happened to me in my musical journey has be, been because I have good mentors. And um, you know the 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 truth is that people like to feel good about themselves. And if I feel like I can you know answer someone's message on Instagram, and they say how do I do this or how do I do that, and I can you know take two minutes to respond. That makes me feel good about myself. So don't be shy in in reaching out to people. I'm not saying, you know, blow up my Instagram, because, uh, you know, I, I um, honestly, here's another thing. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I was on tour with with Robin Ford, and and I don't mean a name drop or anything, but I but I want to give Robert cr- credit for this idea and uh, Robin credit for this idea, and it it comes back to the idea of having good mentors but I was on the tour bus with him and I was on my phone and I'm you know texting away or doing something and and using my thumb and Robin said hey Joe you might just consider you know doing the voice to phone thing and not using your thumb for texting because you know that's a lot of wear and tear on that joint and um, I will say that if you if you're playing guitar be very careful of texting (laughs) And using those thumbs and and vid- video games too probably I, I don't know and also you know guys who get really into into strength training like to the extreme of like bodybuilding and all that I know I've talked to a number of guitar players who have had a lot of physical problems with that but texting is 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 an issue I, I'm usually replying to my DMs with a keyboard especially great being home with a desktop computer during COVID so having good mentors is is really 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 critical. Um, well, it's critical if you want to stay inspired and if you want to practice the right things and, you know, you might as well go to the well because, um, that's, that's where, that's, that's where inspiration is, is, is the freshest. So I'm going to go back to the acoustic for a little bit and just talk a little bit about groove and timing and practicing timing. I realize we've been going for an hour and ten minutes. I'll probably wrap in about twenty minutes. Whoops. There's my tuner. And let me turn the electric channel off so we can get a bit of a cleaner sound. Okay, so the first time I met Tommy Emmanuel, well, it wasn't the first time I I'd met him, but I, I came over to, to Nashville with with my mom when I was like, you know, fifteen, sixteen, and we borrowed ten grand from my, my grandmother rest her soul and um, because flying 
to the States from Australia cost about two grand per person. So my mum and I came over and we stayed in a little hotel in um, on Music Row. Originally, we stayed on, in a bad part of town where there was crack addicts on the stairwell and it was really rough. But we moved to Music Row upon the recommendation of the great Jeff Walker at Arista Media. Thank you, Jeff. But, um, the, you know, I'd come all this way to meet Tommy Emmanuel, who's, who is my, my guitar hero. And I knew Phil, his brother. You know, Phil, Phil and I were, were, were good mates and spent a lot of time on the road playing together. And I sat down with Tommy. Who, who I didn't know as well and hadn't spent as much time around, but he said, he said, um, Joe, you know, upon hearing me playing, he said, Joe, you need to work on your timing and you need to write songs with better melodies. He said, you know, I like to think, he, he, he also said, you're doing great and I listen to your CD and there's some good stuff on here, but he kind of got really straight to the chase and said, you, you need to be better which I, th I think um, meant that he saw that I w wasn't going to quit for one. But, uh, but it, was, it was one of the best pieces of advice he could have given to me. And I'll tell you, for playing fingerstyle guitar, having good pocket and good timing is so difficult, but it's absolutely where it's at. And it's something that I'm always thinking about and I'm always listening back to recordings of myself going oh man I wish that was more in the pocket it's 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 a lifetime of trying to get the music to really groove right and uh, here's another little Tommy Emanuel story we, we were on tour in in Germany we just played a show in a concert hall in a pretty big hall you know two or three thousand people and um, Tommy was doing the Elvis getaway at the time where he would you know finish the last note and then he'd put his guitar on the stand and he'd be in the in the sprinter van going back to the hotel, you know, but before the audience has stopped clapping. And, you know, I was the opening act. So I stayed and packed up my equipment and, uh, you know, would sign some CDs for people. And I'd go back to the hotel, you know, two hours later, just about. And I remember coming up the elevator and I would, my room was on the same floor as Tommy. And I walked past his door and I heard this. And he's practicing away after playing, you know, a two hour concert to a few thousand people. You know, he gave all his energy in that show and he came home and just started practicing on his timing and working on his pocket. So that to me says that it's something that we've always got to be working on and always got to be got to be trying to, you know, sharpen up. So if you were to take a new song you were learning, let's say you were learning I'll See You In My Dreams, which sounds like this. So, you know, I have a True Fire channel and, you know, there's a um, bunch of students in there that, that post videos of themselves playing and, you know, people often send me videos of themselves playing and, and say, you know, can you give me any advice, Joe? And it's usually always like the, the place where there's room for improvement is the timing and the pocket. So if I was learning a song like I'll See You In My Dreams, which is a great tune to learn, I would take the tune and play it. What would the tempo originally be? Tap it in here. Yeah, there you go, right around 90. So I'd take it down to maybe 80. See how that feels. Okay, it's really difficult to play tunes slowly but it's one of the best things for your pocket and your timing so right now I'm gonna take it down like way down and let's see if I can if I can hold it together because this is 
literally how I practice. And we're at 69 now. I just keep wanting to speed up this thing, this guitar. You always got to be, always got to be watching it. So, practicing with the metronome and really trying to dial in that timing is really, really what separates, you know, the people who can get on stage and play through a song with no mistakes from the people who. Um, you know, feel like they can't make it through a piece without making a mistake. The way to smooth out all the creases and find all the weak spots in a song is to slow it way down as much as you can, as much as you can stand it. So, you know, in my, my 15 minute blocks, I will dedicate time to working with my practice pad here, my doing drum rudiments, and also working with the metronome, trying to get my, my pocket and my timing really dialed in. Okay, I'm going to try and read some comments now. Um, are there any other True Fire teachers that you recommend learning licks from? Or do you have a lick and repertoire video? I do have a lick and repertoire. I have a lot of lick and repertoire videos. I have a lick of the week series um, that has, you know, a bunch of my favorite licks. My True Fire channel, by the way, is Joe Robinson Guitar Synergy. And if you, if you scroll, if you go to my Instagram page and click on the bio, there's actually a free seven-day trial. You can check it out if you want. Um, are there any other instructors? Check out Brooks Robertson's channel. Brooks is a good friend of mine. He's a great fingerstyle guitarist. And, um, you know, Tommy Emanuel's channel, of course. Robin Ford's channel. Check those out. Frank Vignola has, you know, a really big channel that he's been doing for a few years, and he has a lot of videos. Um, but, uh, I, I have about, you know, 200 something videos on my True Fire channel now and I teach Freight Train and Windy and Warm and Babies Coming Home and Georgia On My Mind and, uh, Sleepwalk, Albatross, there's tons of great songs on there. I'll see you in my dreams, I'm not sure I've mentioned that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the, the True Fire channel. More stories, please. <laughs> this... This timing and keeping it in the pocket seems to me the big weak point for some mainly playing solo. Absolutely. That's the thing about getting on stage with no other instruments is the timing. People are used to hearing music that's in time. And it's so difficult to get, you know, all 10 fingers to be playing in time, in coordination. And not only to be doing that, but to be doing it without you having to think about it. Because... You know, when you're on stage, you know, I asked Tommy Emanuel what, what he's thinking about when he's on stage. And he said, I'm just thinking about getting a good tone. He said, I'm thinking about the sound of my instrument. And, uh, you know, it's that Billy Joel quote. He stopped playing one of those famous songs when he realized that he was singing it and thinking about the sandwich he was going to have at the hotel later on. You know, you want to stay present and in the song. You want to stay thinking about the sound you're getting, the groove, the time. You don't want to be thinking about the mechanics of playing. You know, you've got to get the muscle memory to the point where you can play the song without thinking it. And that comes from playing a song over and over and over again, slowly with a metronome is the best way to do it, I think. Then some people will say, you know, it's better to practice without a metronome because you don't want to get too used to relying on the metronome. And that's true. You know, you want to have good rhythm and you know before metronomes were used in pop in in music and before you know people tuned a concert pitch for, for that matter you know music sped up and slowed down a little bit you know you listen to great records like September by Earth, Wind and Fire and it slows up and speeds down like it's it's natural for music to fluctuate a little bit but learning how to to you know, just play with good rhythmic feel 
is what we're trying to do. And the metronome, for me, can be a really great tool for doing that, as can the drum practice pad. If any of you are really, you know, hardcore about um, wanting to work on your timing, getting a practice pad and practicing some, some rudiments is, um, is uh, in, invaluable, I think. Is it possible to improvise when playing a bass line? That's a really good question. I think it's um, it's uh, it's something that's really a specialized skill, and someone like Charlie Hunter maybe can really be do a great job with that. If I was to try and improvise, keeping like a bass going. <laughs> That's a good thing to, to practice doing. It's pretty tricky to keep the bass just going on a quarter note like that and play play some, some lead lines. If you were to play a bass line like, um, like if I was to play Blue Moon, like uh, Tommy's arrangement of Blue Moon, which is a great arrangement to learn. Kind of keep the bass going. <laughs> Kinda. And you know, you can kind of improvise a bit over, over that. You can certainly improvise with chord solos, but um, like I said, it's kind of a specialized thing that some people are really great at and I can do it to a point. I love arranging a song with a with a bass line and, and having that kind of be the driving force. But as much as we've talked about improvising, and I think improvising is, you know, to me one of the most fun things about being a guitar player is playing solos. I think I'm mostly a song player. I like to play songs and I like to arrange parts for songs. So... Usually what I'm trying to do is play play melodies. So um and if I'm you know improvise I just totally try to improvise. Any books on theory, rhythm, chord structure, etc. etc.? Definitely. Um there's a great book by Jim Kelly, and I'm not even sure if you can get it online anywhere, but it's one of the best books I've ever read on on uh, chord harmony, it's called the dominant seventh chord, and then the blues, and it's really great. Jim is a, a professor of guitar in Australia, at least he was when I was a, a kid, and he he sent me this book. Just someone recommended I take a lesson with him, and I and I never actually met him. Actually, we, we did meet, but I never took a lesson with him. He just sent me the book, and it's just great. So the dominant seventh chord, and then the blues, um, uh, finding the uh, a real book. The real books are really great. The real books are a collection of jazz standards to play through. And honestly, just learning a bunch of jazz standards is a, a really great thing to do. Can I demonstrate some of my drum rudiments? I'm I'm really... When I, when I start to play drums, I look like a fish out of water. Um, but that doesn't stop me from doing it. And it really helps my, my rudiments. But, you know, paradiddles, double stroke rolls, uh, flams... Uh, the the sticking book, as well as uh, syncopation for the modern drummer, just going through different sticking techniques, and uh, and also working on playing eighth notes, triplets over a click, and then sixteenth notes. It's harder than you think to actually play to play quarter notes, triplet, uh, eighth notes.
and then triplets, and then sixteenth notes. Like doing that with a pair of drumsticks and trying to get really precise with the timing of the notes, seriously difficult. So those are the kind of things I, I practice with the with the drum pad. Um, in terms of other books on theory and chord structure, the books I'm reading at the moment, uh, well, I've been meaning to get into this book for, for years, which is Ted Green's Chord Chemistry. I have two copies of it here, actually. And uh, every time I open it, I, I'm inspired and filled with great ideas, but I, but I don't have um, a lot to offer on my experience with that book because I haven't really dived deep into it. Joe Pass has a book called The Joe Pass Guitar Style, and uh, I think there's a few in that series, and that, those are really great as well. However, there's no tab. It, so if you're like me and kind of handicapped with reading music, I read music terribly, but I can kind of piece it together very slowly. But Joe, Joe Pass's books are, are really great. So anyway, that's about all I have time for. Um, thanks very much for tuning in. And uh, if you did enjoy this, uh, I do have a virtual tip jar set up, joerobinson.com slash tip jar. And uh, also, I do have some educational products. Uh, like I said, my goal with this stream is not to just sell you my, my courses or anything, but Joe's 12 is a um, course I put together. It took about a year and a half to film and prepare um, each each of the 12 weeks, it's a 12-week program, it's a 12-step program, I always say. Each of the 12 weeks is a different topic from practicing to arranging to songwriting to touring. And I interviewed a lot of my mentors and heroes, people like Eric Johnson, Robin Ford, Steve Vai, Tommy Emanuel, John Jorgensen, Rodney Crowell, Gary Nicholson, Brent Mayer. You know, they're all Grammy winners and all legends. Um... And it's a really comprehensive course. It's a very entertaining course as well. Each each week's material is about an hour and a half. Uh, some of them are two hours. Some of them are an hour, roughly an hour and a half each. And uh, there's also tutorial components to it. Joes12.com is where you can find out more about that. And also my True Fire channel, Guitar Synergy, is something that I'm, I'm posting in every day. I uploaded a new series um, of tutorials on Isn't She Lovely. I uploaded this morning, actually. So I teach you the chords. And then I teach you the melody. Then we talk about improvising over the chords. We talk about playing it finger style. And then there's a key change. Anyway, we teach the one song in six different parts. It's pretty cool. And I just uploaded that to my channel this morning. And there's also an open mic section where people post videos themselves playing. And I'll chime in and give you a video response. Um, or not always a video response, but you know, I try to be as active on there as I can and I always respond. So you can sign up to that. That's uh, $12 a month to be part of the channel. And like I said, there's a free trial floating around somewhere if, if, if you want to go that route. Um, I also have other courses with True Fire that, that, that you, you can check out, such as 10 Scales and Modes You Must Know, and a couple of finger style courses. And there's another course coming out next, next uh, month um, on blues phrasing. And it's, it's, it's going to be, I think it turned out really cool. So anyway, thanks very much for being here. I'm going to go live later this evening with a, uh, a concert live stream. So this was an experiment, uh, kind of putting on a bit of a workshop like this. But I really enjoyed um, hanging with you all. Looks like we have yeah, a good number of people that, that tuned in. So thanks very much. And I hope this has been, you know, a little bit of a window into how I think about practicing and approaching my craft, um, you know, I think it's important to think of working on your musical instrument as a craft because it's something you're just always chipping away at and um, that's really, I think, the, the, the beauty of it. So have a great rest of your weekend, everybody, and I'll be going live again today at, uh, tonight at 6 p.m. Central Time. So in, in four hours from now, I'll be, well, three and a half hours. <laughs> 
So take care, everybody, and see you later.